Uh, today I'm going to be looking at um, basic servicing of um, audio amplifiers. Uh, this one's an old 1976 model. It's actually a kit amplifier from Electronics Australia. Uh, the Playmaster Twin 25, although this one doesn't say Twin 25, I think it's exactly the same amplifier. They might have changed the front panel later on. Uh, we've got a, it's a Dick Smith kit, it's got it on the board. Screen printed H8302. And somewhere here I've got the, the old Dick Smith blurb from 1976. For $89.50 you could buy this amp kit. And um, yeah, this one's got Twin 25 in the front. The one I've got here is got the stereo amplifier, so I think it is the same kit though, but possibly Dick Smith changed something or whatever, but um, yeah, these were designed locally. Leo Simpson, who was with Electronics Australia back then, and I think he was actually one of the guys, or the guy that started Silicon Chip Magazine. So at least this one I've got a circuit for it. So we're gonna have a look at some of the basics. And it's a good simple one, all, all discrete components ex except for a couple of uh, they, one of the old L OLM741 op amps. Can't believe I forgot those things, but real old op amps. They're just used in the phono preamp section. Um, the rest of it's all discrete components basically. On the back panel, we've got our 2N3055s, four of those. And yeah, just one of these old C core type transformers, JT235, which is one you can buy at Dick Smith and JCAR and others, I believe. Uh, yeah, a couple of big filter caps, a few fuses, and, and yeah, the rest of it's all discrete transistor, and yeah, not much else to it. It was a bit more of an advanced design in its day. I was reading through the, the design philosophy of it and how it works, so it sounds like this was a bit more advanced than some of the earlier amplifiers. Um, less feedback, uh, also the use of, there's a couple of pots here to set the quiescent current so the transistors are always set to just be on even if there's no signal so that they're ready to take any sort of transient like sudden sudden signals that come in uh, without having a, to get going type of thing and possibly distorting the signal in the process. Uh, it's got a couple of these filters on the output, a couple of chokes and I think there's a resistor and capacitor involved in that, something to do with uh, I think stopping radio frequency coming back in uh, from the speaker leads and I think there was another reason they had that and um, yeah so it's just not a not a bad little amp these were um, and certainly for $89 that was a pretty good you know probably a few hours to build it but um, a lot cheaper than what you could buy a Japanese or something stereo amplifier pre-built in those days so yeah we'll just get into this and have some a look at some of the basics um, obviously we start with the power, I guess. We've basically, these things just, as we can see in the circuit here, very simple power supply. Most net commercial amplifiers are the same. Basically, just got a power switch coming in off the mains, straight into your transformer. Just an old iron core, copper and iron transformer. Pretty much all amps up into the modern age have those. Uh, into it, out of that, it's a center tap because we've basically got the Obviously audio is like a sine wave, so it goes from the negative to, to um, positive cycles. So basically the, the power supply is the same, it's got a center tap, and then you've got a plus rail and a minus rail, which is plus and minus 30 volts in this case. This is 25 watts a channel, so you're gonna need some sort of voltage around that amount. Um, Cause you basically gotta be able to, the, the output of the amplifier is obviously a lot larger signal than the input, and that's all to do with the the amount of uh, voltage that it can swing so a bigger sine wave has basically just got a higher voltage peak to peak so you start off with about, yeah, I think it's about line level about half a volt or so peak to peak um, so not a very big signal and by the time it's coming out of the amplifier you might be getting up around the 15-25 volts peak to peak um, although really this, because it's got plus and minus 30 volt, you could actually go up more towards a 50-60 volt sort of range from peak to peak, so it'll swing 30 volts positive and 30 volts negative, even though you would never drive it up to the full voltage rail because that'll cause clipping basically, or likely to. So all we've got is yeah, power switch, India transformer, bridge rectifier, and this has got a couple of xenodiodes to get a couple of low voltage rails, plus and minus 15 volts as well. Um, just to run the, the preamp section, things like that phono preamp, 
We've got a couple of 4700 mic 35 volt. Uh, that's those big filter caps there. And there's some, it looks like the fuses are actually later in on the output stages. Or well, two of them are. There's four fuses in this. Not sure where they put the other ones. But yeah, some of you will have some fuses. Most modern ones will have the fuses right on the input somewhere. Uh, if not, not actually, I don't think many of them are actually fused on the primary side of the transformer on the 240 volt or 110 volt side. But they will um, usually be fused after the transformer, usually straight after in case that bridge rectifier shorts out. So technically this is not the best design because if the bridge rectifier shorts out it could cook the transformer. Especially since these old transformers probably haven't got a thermal fuse in them like the modern ones. But generally you'll find power problems are pretty rare in amplifiers. Uh, some of the, uh, the later amps will have a thermal fuse in your transformer. It'll usually be a circuit board mount transformer or one with at least a circuit board each side of it. Um, so one thing you can often look at those is where the pins go in. There'll be a pair of pins with a couple of silver wires going into the actual windings and the rest will have copper windings. Usually if, that, if there's no power at all, it can just be that they, that thermal fuse is gone, usually for no good reason. Uh, and you can bypass those. It's usually best rather than just, just to short them out. You can buy an aftermarket, I think it's 105 degree thermal fuse. I used to just um, solder them across the two terminals if they were open circuit and then push it down behind a bit of this plastic or under this wrap or something between the the because um, they're plastic coated you could put them between the the iron and the the copper just so that technically if it does overheat again it should blow that fuse rather than anything catching fire um, which is pretty unlikely transformers normally go open circuit before they get too bad but uh, it is best to replace those if it's had one uh, so this has got some so uh, then you've got your bridge rectifier diodes. Again, they can go short circuit and that'll blow your fuse. Um, pretty rare they ever do, but it can happen. Sometimes they're like a, a single package, four diodes in a little black package rather than individual diodes like in this one. Uh, a couple of filter capacitors. These can be upright ones like the, the axial ones. or the, oh, These are the axial. They're the um, radial, I should say. Um, so they just come in different packages, usually some sort of rating around that, uh, you know, anywhere up to 63 volts in most amps. Big amps may go even higher, and usually up around the 4700 mic, something like that. Um, again, pretty rare they go. Sometimes you'll find them, um, particularly these, these uh, radial ones, they'll have a bit of a bulge in the top or something if they're gone. But they can actually fail. They're getting so old now that it's a wonder that a lot of them aren't failing, but a lot of these still seem to be in good condition. Um, so obviously we've got no power, um, you want to check basically, you can just check across the actual power cord. The first easiest test is set your multimeter to continuity or resistance and you just go across, make sure the power switch is on and we should get a, basically a short circuit across the active and neutral pins going into the power plug so that basically proves Whoops, all the primary part of our circuit's working, our switch, our transformer's all in circuit. Um, some later amps will have a relay, uh, so you have to, basically you should, it should still get a short circuit because it will have two transformers, one for standby and the main big, big transformer for the amp section, but the big transformer won't be shut in until the amp's turned out of, or won't be connected up until the amp's pulled out of standby. In which case it'll be a relay in series with the main windings of the main amp, uh, the main transformer, and so that that won't come on until that relay clicks in. So you might get a standby light and nothing else. Uh, that'll be something in the standby circuit, uh, or could be something to do with the relay that switches the main transformer or further into the circuit. But even even those would usually have a standby transformer, so it should measure something across the mains lead, even if it's not the main transformer. You'll get the little secondary transformer. Um, if you do have blown fuses it'll usually be a semiconductor that's shorted out, something to do with like a bridge rectifier or these output transistors or if it has an output IC that'll often be blown which is basically just a bunch of transistors and stuff in a plastic case so it basically replaces all these discrete components and those big output transistors with a, an aluminium plate with a thick film on it and then just plastic over the front so what, what can go wrong with these discrete ones is basically the same in those big chips except with the chips you just got to pull the chip out and replace it. Uh, whereas these you can actually find individual components and replace the individual transistors that are blown. 
So the next thing, if you, if you do, if you do have a blown fuse, obviously you check your fuses and make sure they're all intact for continuity. But if one is blown, uh, the first thing you check is this bridge rectifier and just make sure the diodes measure should be, yeah, because we've got filter caps that don't, they don't always measure as neatly as they should because you'll get a bit of charge on the caps, but they should be up around the 0.6 volt in the forward direction, that is positive on the anode, negative on the uh, cathode, which is the one with the band, but just make sure they're not short circuit. These ones are the opposite way around. And again, I'm charging a cap up, but it should settle down around somewhere around the 0.6 volt range. I mean, I know these ones are good anyway, but as long as they're not shorted, because they will cause the main fuse to blow, usually on the, on the primary side of the transformer. The next easiest check is across these capacitors. Again, we'll get some sort of charging of the caps. So one of these is a plus 30 volt, one is a minus 30 volt or whatever, whatever voltage your amp runs on. So these are basically across the, out, the output transistors are across these, or yeah, across, because they're on each uh, rail, negative and positive rail. So if you get a short circuit across either of these, the next thing you'd look at is your output stage. But this is this amp's obviously all right, so there's no short there. Um, another thing that can go wrong is you can lose somewhere here. There's some little Zener diodes. I'm not sure if they're the ones over here by the look of it. They have BZX79s and a couple of capacitors. So you might, if you've got no preamp sort of section, you might have power, but no sound getting through it. No short circuit, no blown fuse. You would check these smaller rails. They usually have lower voltage rails, like I say, plus or minus 15 in this one. You definitely want to check that there's it there, uh, which we can probably do with this one easily enough. By right, going to volt DC, turn the power on, and I think the voltages across should be pretty much across those Zener diodes. Now you can usually find ground just on one of the RCA sockets or any of these pots, usually even the case itself. So I've got minus 14 there, and this will probably be on the other side of the diode. Maybe not. Oh, there it is. Just didn't make a good connection. So I've got 15 on one, minus 15 roughly on the other. We can also check these capacitors. And on these um, the large filter caps, often you have to access them under the board. These are axial ones, so they're nice and easy to get to on the top. And we have 32 volts there, so we should have plus and minus, and also zero volts on the center tap. I'm not sure which connection's which, but you just go through and check it. So we've got minus 32, positive 32, so that's our positive rail, negative rail. These capacitors, that black band's pointing to the zero. And then it's just a matter of getting to the other end. And we should have zero volts. And zero volts, because those two capacitors are joined together here on this center tap out of the transformer. That's our zero volt rail common rail, so we've got 147 mic from the 30 with its negative on that and another 4700 mic which has its negative on the 30 minus 30 volt rail and it's positive on the common so that's the first basic check if we've got all that running we know we've got voltage should be getting through to our preamp section we've also got it through to our output stages those 2N3055 transistors on the back in this one so we should um, have an amp that runs but that still doesn't necessarily mean it does, but at least there should be no short circuits, no power open circuits. So we know we've got a good chance of at least getting some sort of sound out of this amp. Um, the next basic check you do with every amplifier before you connect it to any speakers is again on volts DC, is go across your speaker terminals. And there should be virtually nothing on there. There might be a few millivolts, but there shouldn't be too much. That yeah, one's slightly higher, so the bias adjustment or quiescent current adjustment in the that potentiometer on one of these channels might need a slight tweak again. It's probably got a bit out over time, and this is an old amp. But always check for very low voltage or no voltage on the outputs. If you're getting a bit of a voltage, you can always put like a 100 ohm resistor or something there, just just see if it drags the voltage down. Because some of the older amps, you have a output coupling capacitor which will charge up. But all the modern ones. Uh, as you can see in this, there's no electrolytic capacitors, a couple of tantalums and stuff, but no capacitive coupling in the 
output stage because that's how they've designed all these ones they're all direct coupled or DC coupled and so in that case the outputs um, should have no DC on it um, you, if there's DC on it it's because basically these output transistors on the back panel there or the output IC are hooked um, they sh it should blow a fuse in theory but won't necessarily if any they're hooked from the minus 30 volt rail and positive 30 volt rail and our speaker output is here where that inductor is and if you come down through this fuse that's our main output transistor and you've got like a, a very low what is it a 1 ohm 1 watt resistor and same with the other channel and they basically except that's from the negative rail 2 amp fuse output transistor 1 ohm resistor and that joins the other 1 ohm resistor and then they go straight out there is a 10 ohm resistor and an inductor but the inductor is basically a short circuit and they go to your headphone socket into your speaker so if either of those transistors shorts you're going to get that full 30 volt rail straight down through the transistor which is now a short collected to emitter through the resistor and straight out into your speaker um, now if you hook a speaker up hopefully it'll blow that fuse um, but not necessarily quick enough it can cook the coil in your speaker so that's why you never hook a speaker up because if we've got an output stage fault which is common uh, people have either cranked amp too hard and blown the outputs or they've shorted the terminals out put um, uh, speakers of too low an impedance like 4 ohms on an amp rated for 8 and cranked up the volume and blown the outputs and the first thing you'll get is a dead short across or across the output stage which will put full DC rail and you know, this is probably good for a couple of amps at 30 volts each side um, that'll put that straight onto your speaker terminals in theory if they blow both sides the negative and positive side both output transistors you could get up to 60 volts across there at a couple of amps and that'll cook your speaker coil voice coil really quickly so never ever hook them up until you've checked but this one's fine there's very very little there also if there is a bit of voltage there it does give you an idea that maybe you need to set your quiescent or bias pots so that's another thing to check but as long as that's as long as that's got close to zero volts on there uh, we are pretty safe to hook it up now you can actually use a dummy load these are uh, 100 watt at 8 ohms uh, they're just a big resistor basically big piece of ceramic tube with some sort of resistive wire wrapped around it there it's just wrapped around it's actually like a an element out of a toaster or something this flat bit of metal and it just goes round and round and round these are made to be non-inductive because you don't want induction sort of in your speaker loads but for most uh, situations it's probably not going to be a big problem but ideally you can buy these proper ones from somewhere like Wagner Electronics in Australia and these are really handy because if you've got an amp of unknown condition or if you're working on an amp and you need to be like you, you would still check the DC but there's no DC because if you hook this up you'll probably do more damage to the amp or blow something because it's going to pull a heap of current out of it but if you need to run an amp at really high volume you can just hook one of these up and soak test it at you know, you know full volume or close to it um, for you know as long as you want basically because these don't they do vibrate a little bit but they don't make any real sound so you can't really run a, a proper speaker at full volume or close to it um, they're also just good if you're working on an amp and you're worried because if you short something out or do something wrong you may blow a speaker if it's hooked up so at least you've got a dummy load you can sort of run the amp on a load and check a few things and if you do something wrong or something dies while you're working on it or whatever it, it's not going to blow one of these it, or just should just blow the fuse and that's it so that's one thing you can use another thing you can do with these is also if you hook i forget what value we used to use but it's probably around 100 ohm or something resistor off one of these terminals into a speaker and you've also got the speaker on the other terminal you can actually get you can crank this up crank the amp up really loud um, and this will be taking the full full sort of volume of the amp but the speaker that you've got hooked across it is a good monitor you can actually hear it listen to what the amp's doing but it's only you know a fraction of the the total volume so there's another thing you can do also with your test speakers especially if you've got them hooked across something like this just to be safe you should really put a fuse like a one amp fuse or something in line just a quick blow fuse because if in normal test conditions you're not putting much current through the amp but if something shorts out and DC comes out the output you want a fuse that will blow pretty quick um, it does happen I know when I used to do a lot of amplifier and audio repairs we certainly blew a few sets of speakers even with all the precautions taken occasionally something would happen and still kill your speaker 
I mean they were only low wattage speakers so it didn't take much we just used any old rubbish we could get our hands on basically because um, when you blew them up you didn't really care just threw it in the rubbish and got another one um, you also need yeah obviously have a set of test speakers somewhere so we can hook those up and and check it and since this amp seems to be okay it's quite safe to hook some speakers up and use the proper test speakers because it's always nice to have a listen to it the next test basically is to listen and see what the amp's actually doing or if it's doing anything uh, if any sounds going through it and I'll get those connected up with the power off preferably so in case you short anything out you don't want to touch these wires you don't want either of them to touch each other or the other channel or the chassis of the amp which is usually earth uh, it's even more critical in car radios which are actually floating above there is the negative terminal is at some DC voltage uh, rather than at ground these are not so bad probably if we shorted the negative terminal out it wouldn't matter so much because that would be ground in this I think yeah, it is uh, but if you short the positive terminal to the chassis or to the uh, to the ground which are basically the same thing usually or onto the other channel or something you may blow an output or something we'll turn that on and we'll get a bit of a click out of the speakers that's always a good sign that it's working sometimes give the volume control a bit of a flick uh, the other thing is always check make sure your volume controls set to minimum before you turn anything on it's a good old trick to have the volume flat out when you turn it on after you've been fiddling with it or something so always you're trying to remember to turn the volume down make sure it's down at minimum before you turn the amp on even with no signal but it's always best to, a good habit to get into uh, so we do have a little bit of scratchiness there some of the other pots being an old amp I can actually if I turn it right up yeah I can hear a bit of hiss that's just the background noise of the amplifier especially since the inputs aren't grounded out or anything they're just open so that's another test just to see if you've got that background hiss um, obviously the simplest uh, input test is you can as long as you're only touching stuff around the the RCA sockets on the input you can just use a screwdriver and put a bit of hum in there that's auxiliary 2 that's the most basic way to test yeah both channels are there that tells you you've got a working amp I mean or at least to a degree uh, if it just puts out a nice 50 Hertz hum it's probably a runner but ideally use something like a signal generator and actually inject a proper signal just to check it first if you want to do it te the technical way you could just plug a CD player or something a music source and just have a listen to it is another alternative but um, certainly if you've got any sort of distortion faults or anything you're going to need a signal generator just to put out a clean sine wave uh, turn the volume down turn it back on so there we have a just a sine wave which must be around that 500 odd hertz that we've got shown here can probably get that can i get that up to one ki oh that's probably just gone past one kilohertz it sounds pretty close So we know that's a, a good clean signal. You can check both channels. Got a pretty scratchy, pretty scratchy balance pot there. You can actually hear that the tone controls are having some effect on that signal, even though it's right up in the high end. So that looks pretty good. So basically all these, these amplifiers are doing is you've got your input signals. I mean this is a pretty basic design, so the input signals other than the phono just go straight into a source selecting switch. That's your switch on the front, it goes from tuna, phono, auxiliary, etc. And out of that we've got a tape monitor switch. So we've got tape out, tape monitor, so that's the uh, playback. So they usually have the tape play tape or source switch as it is on this or play or record tape play or record switch so that's the tape out that's the record output 
so through this just goes straight through the all the inputs go into the source switch and then one of them comes straight back out the signal that goes into the amp is your tape out so always the easiest test with an amp if you've got an amplifier it looks like all the power's there and you've got no sound coming out of the speakers just go to the uh, tape output socket and often they go through a bit more than this but it gives you some idea that you've got power going into the preamp section of that in this case it probably doesn't matter because this is basically all passive components it's just a switch up to that point so it's not going to tell us a lot but it can be a handy point just to to check that or if you've got a preamp out is even better because a preamp out is basically between all this tone controls input selection and preamps and stuff and this output section here which is well there's two of them there um, so that's preamp out is an excellent spot to check um, again if you've got distortion or anything if you disconnect the pre usually there's some links or something joining it or a switch and you disconnect the preamp out from the amp out uh, you can check the signal there with a sine wave through it and just make sure it's clean or if it's not then it's the preamp that's faulty if it is clean but you've got a distorted speaker output then you know your output section's faulty so so basically this is here, got the phono input, it's the only one that goes through an IC and stuff because that's a much lower input and there's some capacitors and resistors and stuff that basically, because the equalisation, they basically change the, when they record a record, I think they take all the low frequency stuff out because it would make really big tracks, you know, big cuts in the record. So they filter out all the low frequencies so it makes a nice fine track and they can fit more, a longer track on the record basically. And then when you plug it back into the amp, this this has to boost up the signal and also has to get that frequency response back right again so that you've got all your base signal there again um, so that again is switched through the source switch and then basically after that after our tape play record switch we're straight you know, through a resistor and straight into the volume control so it's a 50k pot so dual pot in this case one for each channel because we're just looking at a one half of the amp here uh, after that we're going on a transistor which I think I believe is just to boost the signal up a bit and isolate the tone controls So we've got our bass treble They again just have some resistors and capacitors that just alter the frequency When you turn it down one way it's basically pulling say the bass frequencies to ground Thus removing them and the other way I'm not sure how they actually boost them But um, it's probably changing the frequency response a bit there and the same with the treble at one end it will basically remove the treble at the other end, boost it up so they go through there that's the capacitor, I'll save this transistor so it looks like we've got a couple more stages They're all run this is all running off our plus 15 volts and the negative 15 volts may be around here, may not be I can't see it there so I'm not sure what they're using that for it's probably connected to something here but anyway we go into our first, looks like preamp stage and there's our balance control, so there is a probably a tantalum capacitor, there's a couple of you know, actually a few capacitors here, so these stages are basically that stops each stages each transistors, how, how the DC voltages are set up on it it basically isolates them from the next transistor so they can all be set up to buy these resistors on the base and stuff to have whatever bias voltages and stuff they need without affecting the next stage, so that's all those capacitors normally doing uh, so we get to the balance pot Obviously that goes off to the other channel and that basically has a, the centre tap of the potentiometer goes to ground. Uh, it's basically like a, a volume control in two directions rather than just one. So our normal volume control, one side's on ground, one side's on the input signal and the, the centre tap basically, centre part, the wiper, goes into the actual amp. So the closer you wind that down towards ground, obviously the quieter it is. And as you wind it the other way, you're getting less and less resistance between the output, the the wiper, and the actual input from the signal. So at one end it's basically shorter to the signal, at the other end it's shorter to the ground. And that determines basically that wiper is either towards the ground end or towards the um, signal end or in the middle. And that determines how much signal gets through. The balance pot, basically the center is grounded and that then depending where you, the wiper is it'll either pull the left channel to ground or the right channel to ground or in the middle this will be a fairly that's another 50k pot or so it might be a bit higher but that will just leave a higher resistance in the middle you've got about 25k to each channel or each channel to ground i should say so it basically lets the whole signal through whatever's come through so far and it's not pulling it down at all so after that we would go so i guess that's a and b it goes into this is the output section 
and this has all sorts. I think this is all these transistor pairs and diodes and stuff are to do with setting the the quiescent current, which again, like I say, is just to basically bias these output stages on ready to go sort of thing. So they're pulling a bit of current all the time, then they're never completely off. So if a sudden signal change comes in from a quiet section, especially with like classical music or something, the amp's already sort of biased on, the transistors are kind of running and ready to go. When that signal comes in, they can handle it no problem, no distortion or or anything like that. Um, and we've got our, there's a transistor here. Looks like it goes, that's the, the negative side. That's the positive side. 30 volt, minus 30 volt rail, plus 30 volt rail. And that probably, that must set the quiescent current. Not quite sure exactly how it's set up, but it adjusts the voltages going to the bases of these transistors, I would think. It's got a little trim pot there. Um, so then you basically, each of these stages is basically just making the signal bigger and bigger. So you've got a half a volt or so going in and these preamp sort of stages and then into the amp itself. Each of these transistors that's actually in the amp chain itself is just sw swinging the, the sine wave higher and lower basically more negative and more positive than the one before so you start off with a very small sine wave that can go half a volt up and half a volt down or quarter of a volt up and down and then by the time it gets through here it's starting to get to more volts until it eventually can almost swing between plus 30 volt and, and minus 30 volt obviously through zero in the center and so that gives it almost a 60 volt range of um, sine wave 30 volts on each side or getting towards 60 peak to peak and like I said there is some sort of inductor on the output of this and a resistor and capacitor which is yeah, something to do with radio interference I think they said and after that we've basically got a headphone socket which again can be a problem if you've got no sound uh, you may have to check going into the headphone socket that there is an actual audio this one's wired over here off the outputs so all the headphone socket does is it has internal switching in it so when you pull the plug out those switches should just run the output straight out to the speaker output they can go faulty the contacts can get bent or something and you'll find a channel missing or no channels because you've actually got to have a faulty headphone socket so it sometimes pays to check there's audio going in on the input side of the headphone socket on the switches um, you can if you plug your headphones in that opens the switches and disconnects the speaker and it hooks up to basically the headphones are connected via a couple of 330 ohm resistors in this case which reduces the volume quite a lot because you don't want full speaker volume going into your headphones you just want a quarter a much lower signal and that's what those resistors do so the headphones are fed via resistors to reduce the volume so that's another thing to look for is faulty contacts in that if you plug the headphones in you usually find they'll work but if, if you've got headphones both channels working but one or other speaker not working that can be these contacts so that's always something to check but generally if the output transistors are alright and everything you won't don't get much go wrong with these as long as they're not shorted the output stage will usually be fine you won't get any open circuits but occasionally the headphone socket if it has one can be a problem um, and about all, all the the other problems you get with these is you'll get a really distorted signal because some, usually one of these driver transistors or something has failed. Um, yeah, it's pretty rare for any of the resistors or capacitors to go. Some of the older amps, if they've got electrolytic coupling capacitors, they can basically reduce the volume or lose the channel because the coupling capacitors uh, gone has dried out, gone sort of open circuit. So that's another thing to check. But um, yeah, occasionally you'll get distortion. Most of these amps have a form of feedback to from the output back into the input stages uh, to basically control how the amp operates and stop it running away and stuff so sometimes you're going to have problems where you'll get distortion somewhere in these later stages and it'll feed back and you can't really pinpoint where it is because it's everywhere it's right through the amp and if you disconnect anything you sort of disconnect the whole lot and you're still none the wiser sometimes of, of where the actual distortion is sometimes you can disconnect these earlier stages and get a good sine wave right through and you know that that stage is probably all right but other times you can't always be sure it's then just a matter of checking the transistors on basic tests and um, checking the dc voltages feeding them uh, good thing about a stereo amp is you've got two channels so you can basically compare 
In this stage, we've got you know two twin preamps. You'll find most of the components look the same twice. We've got two tantalums, two transistor pairs there, and that's one output stage there and another there. And again, you can see the transistors are all pretty much the same. Resistors, inductors, etc. So if you've got any doubts, you just measure, compare one channel to the other. Um, if worse comes to worse, sometimes you can even cut into the signal path somewhere and by removing a coupling cap or something and actually wire it across to the other channel uh, and vice versa and actually swap the signal between the channels somewhere. You've got to be a bit careful with these direct drive, direct connected ones um, because you can't just go and do that because of the DC coupling. Um, there's a chance you might upset something or blow something up. But um, with some of the older amps, at least from the preamp section into each amp, you can swap even if they haven't got a preamp out, you can actually swap the signals over and just make sure um, which, you know, see whether the fault swap changes channels or not will indicate where, which part of the um, amp is faulty. So we've got a faulty preamp and you swap it over, swap the channels over, swap which amp it goes into. If the, if the fault is in one channel and then it changes to the other, then obviously the amp's all right, but the preamp is faulty. But if you swap the preamp over and it doesn't make any difference in that amp channel which has the distortion or whatever, uh, that'll be the faulty one. Uh, so you've basically isolated it to the amp section and then you can just often just measure DC voltages on all these transistors and that'll give you some idea if, if there's like a leaky transistor or something like that, it'll give you some idea of where the fault will lie. But it is pretty rare that you actually find that. Most of the amp faults are either something in the power and even that's fairly rare, or blown output transistors, which is, or IC, which is the most common thing you'll find in amps. Uh, most of these solid state amps are amazingly reliable. Even, you know, an old thing like this, there was probably, this one wasn't necessarily built around 76, it was designed in 1976. This one looks, I think the fact it's got a different front panel on it means it was a later batch. And I'm not sure when they stopped selling these, but I think they were around at least to the mid 80s, maybe the late 80s. But it's still quite an old amp. Uh, it'd be at least 30 years, probably going on 40 years, and it, it, um, generally everything in it will still be fine. Um, even with Dick Smith's, God knows where he got half these components from, Taiwan or somewhere back in those days, but um, yeah, most of them seem to last really well. So it's more scratchy pots, blown output stages, sometimes something in the power, but a lot of them you'll just open up and you'll find that you've got a blown fuse, and then it's just a matter of finding what's shorted. Sometimes you can get things like um, someone will have a speaker protection circuit and that won't go. That's another indication often that you've you've got DC on the output. In that case, you'll have shorted outputs, but you'll measure the speaker terminals. And there's no DC there. Um, but what you've got to check is if if it's got a relay in it. We'll have a look at that in some amps later. I've um, got some here with speaker protectors. Most of the, the modern commercial ones have them. And it's just a relay which detects whether there's a, couple, there's a circuit in there to detect DC on the output stage. Um, and basically, the speed, when you switch the amp on, the speakers are disconnected, and the amp checks if there's any DC on its output stage. And if there's none, then after a few seconds, that, amp, that relay, you'll hear it go click, and that'll connect the speakers to the amplifier. But if there is a DC fault due to shorted outputs or some other problem, uh, that, that'll never click in. You'll never hear it go click and you'll have no sound, even though the amp looks like it's running besides that. Uh, so that's another fairly common thing. Sometimes the actual circuit feeding the relay can fail and it, it just won't click in because something's wrong in the drive circuit or you'll get dry joints on the coil. Sometimes dry joints on the speaker connections on those relays, so that can be something else to check. That is another problem in amps, is especially with um, STK type output chips soldered to the board, you'll get dry joints on the chips. Some of them have um, like pre-driver chips, they're just like a car step or car, a mono 5 watt amplifier or something chip that'll replace this preamp stage and they'll just feed it that into a output transistors and they can get dry joints on them, that was quite a common thing in some amps. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think what else really went wrong with them, but most of them it's pretty straightforward. You'll, you'll have the amp not running, blown fuses, output stage is dead. Sometimes it's not even a blown, not even a blown output stage. Someone's just blown. That luckily the fuse is blown because someone's overloaded it or shorted out the outputs or something. Um, so you'll just have to change the fuses. But you always go through all the checks before you put new fuses in. There's no point putting new fuses in an amp, um, hoping that'll fix it. It will sometimes, but um, like any TV power supply or anything else, it's you do your basic checks. 
um, before you put new fuses in because you can cause more damage sometimes a lot of the time it won't but it's always a chance you might uh, blow blow more stuff sometimes uh, with these direct coupled amps where everything's DC coupled no caps in between one of the problems is if the output transistors go they can blow multiple uh, stages leading up to that most of them won't usually the output short out that takes all the voltages down to nothing until the fuse blows and that actually protects the rest of the amp but it is your if you ever have to change output transistors always check the driver transistors uh, at least the first stage after them I usually just pretty much check all of them uh, usually if, if DC's come back sometimes the output transistor can short to base or something if it's come back through these they'll usually just be shorted and it's obvious um, you can also basically fire the amp up without the output remove the shorted outputs and fire it up and just check that it, both channels look like they're feeding the same voltages and stuff in there and the transistors are basically set up the same um, that's another way you can check it before you put new outputs in because if something's shorted in the drive stage it can blow a brand new set of output transistors which aren't always the cheapest and it's just a pain in the bum basically so um, always best to check that as well um, you can get things like these preamp chips and stuff getting noisy or something again very rare so maybe some of the 70s amps and stuff um, some of these old chips aren't always the best they don't last or they they get the the pins sort of corrode on them and I think something eats up inside the, the chip itself or you get silver migration some of these old transistors um, where the metal, I think they've got a silver coating on the leads and it actually creeps across from one lead to the other on the outside of the case it basically migrates, the little atoms for some reason start spreading out and you can get a sort of short across, I think also in, internally in the transistor they can do a similar thing but uh, generally all this sort of modern silicon uh, transistor amps very reliable in that sense so um, yeah now I could basically hook this one up and um, hook a signal into it and just have a look on the oscilloscope what the outputs doing um, so yeah we can instead of having our speakers hooked up if you had a a um, although we might need something to connect the crow to because these terminals aren't the best Actually, I actually can go to earth on the case anyway I'll go on the back of the speaker terminal here oh yeah there is a capacitor to ground so these probably aren't grounded directly um, again with cast areas and stuff you've got to be careful about putting earth probe grounds on them or on the output chips because they can blow them because they're not, not sitting at earth ok so I've got the oscilloscope connected up and we'll just have a look like if you had a, a distorted amp or anything um, so there's our sine wave we're set currently to 0.2 volts a division so five divisions is about a volt output uh, I might I'll disconnect that other channel because we don't want to listen to that so yeah got about a volt output there and as we turn the volume up and that's a nice clean sine wave at the moment we can make it a bit closer together see more waves and then if we crank up our input voltage and keep turning up yeah as it's seen a little bit of something on the, the waveform there so we're one volt of division so that's one two three four and it probably well yeah depends on the input signal how loud that is how loud we can get the amp so that's only a few volts, we've got a little bit of something on the little bit of oscillation on the actual waveform so though that could be my frequency generator but um, generally that's not too bad what you'd be looking for bring them in closer is usually with a distorted waveform obviously it won't be a nice sign pattern now if you get clipping which is basically the the um, signal can't get a proper DC enough DC voltage or it's exceeding the DC voltage available to it um, often that'll happen when amps are turned up to their maximum if they haven't been designed the best they'll actually start going to clipping and you'll get the the sine wave the top and bottom will be squared off instead of a nice loop or curve they'll actually start chopping off so so it clips the waveform off um, yeah it's usually a sign that something can't isn't getting enough voltage 
um, to do the full deflection needed basically of the sine wave. Um, can be a faulty transistor or something. Um, you can also get crossover distortion, which is basically we've got our zero volts sort of going through the center here somewhere. And yeah, that's our positive, that's our negative. And as this waveform comes across the um, the zero, the zero road crossing line basically, there'll be some sort of kick in the the and the waves will be offset a bit or something, some sort of distortion there. But basically anything that distorts a nice curvy sine wave is a sign that you've got some sort of problem in your amp. And it's a matter of checking, trying to find out which stage is actually doing it. You can isolate the preamp and make sure that's not that's the preamp output doesn't have it. If it does have it, then it's something in the preamp. Uh, usually it'll be something in the output stage. So it's a matter of checking uh, from there. Make sure your, your rails are correct, right up to the transistors. If any of these like emitter resistors go high or something, you might find that it's not getting the correct voltage to the output stage, which could potentially something like that could cause some clipping or something, um, or some other sort of distortion in the waveform. One, one half of it won't be able to, if it can't get the full voltage rail, it may not be able to, um, it won't be symmetrical basically through the, if we adjust the position of this, Technically, uh, this uh, x-axis in the in the oscilloscope on the graticule or whatever they call it, um, that's your zero volts. So we're swinging positive, we're swinging negative from that. And um, yeah, if something, if one side isn't the same hot amplitude, basically, so if it goes positive two volts, it should also go negative two volts at the same time. You shouldn't get like two volts one way, one volt the other. Well, that means there's some sort of it's a form of distortion basically something in in one half of the amplifier uh, isn't able to basically probably hasn't got the full rail going to it or something it can't access the full voltage so it's not swinging as far as it should which will make it sort of flattened out half of the waveform and it's not going to sound too pretty um, but yeah normally you'll see like quite a a sort of squared off section or something like that a kick in a sort of dog leg or something in the signal um, it's been a long time since I've actually had to fix an amp with um, distortion or anything in it. It's pretty rare normally. Um, again, these modern ones, um, very rare to get anything like that. The parts generally last in them, but sometimes if you've got a bad transistor or something uh, in the preamp or pre sort of drive to the outputs, um, I don't think I've ever had outputs cause distortion, uh, but it's usually something to do in this drive section. And like I say, because they sometimes have feedback, I think most amps have feedback negative feedback somewhere, the signal gets fed back in from the output back to the input somewhere or somewhere along the chain. Uh, that can often make it difficult because the, the distortion anywhere in the chain will sort of feed back in so it'll look like it's at the input to the chain even though it's coming from part way in so that can be a little bit more difficult to track down. You can't just follow through the transistors. Normally you'd, if you had distortion or something, you'd want to get your oscilloscope and just trace through these transistor stages and see where the signal goes and see if you can find a point at which it becomes distorted. Uh, if it was a video signal in a TV or VCR or something, um, or so, usually in these in the preamp section, if you've got distortion, you can go from stage to stage and check each transistor. Usually transistors are just the easiest point being the active components. We can simply just hook on, if I can find an earth here somewhere, I can just touch it, but we start hooking onto the bases. That'll be much lower signal now. Ah, wrong one. Put our weight down lower there. But you can hook onto the base of any transistors. Oh, it's too big now. And just follow the signal through. So you, you know you've got a good sine wave going in the back here. You can just follow that through. Um, one of the easiest places to find usually the transition from... This one's different the way it's designed, but normally in most amps you have the... Yeah, is that... No, it can't be right. You know, they do, they put the volume before the tone control. You know, I think most amps, you know, that's a bit of an odd one. Most amps, as I was saying, the signal will come through the preamp, uh, through the selector switch, into the preamp, into the tone controls, and then you'll have the volume and the balance sort of on the end of that chain. So, and then from the volume control, it'll go into the actual amplifier stages proper. So often the, the volume control is another good place. It's basically located where the preamp out would go so even if you haven't got a preamp out socket have a look at your um, actual volume control and um, your one side like I say one side of the pot should be ground 
the other one should be the full signal out of the preamp and the, and the middle one usually the wiper will then feed into the amp section so you can just check the signal there on your volume pot um, that basically that splits the amp between preamp and tone control and all that sort of stuff and main amplifier section so if you check on that uh, you'll find whether you've got a I think that's the connections to it there that's our volume pot isn't it so if we check that we've got nothing yeah it's a fairly low signal I'll need to up the range a bit I think by the look of it but basically that'll give you, if you've got a good signal, good sine wave coming out of your volume control yeah, so one side's ground, we've got nothing and the other two are either the preamp or going into the amp so that's another good place uh, if you've got no distortion there then you know that the preamp section's working if you do have distortion there then it's the preamp section could be anywhere leading from the input socket all the way up to the volume control basically and if, if that's all fine at the volume pot then you know your distortion or any other signal problems are in the actual amp itself it's a good place too when you've got no sound if the amp's completely quiet but it looks like all the power rails and stuff are running then just check your volume control put a signal on the input it can be anything but a sine wave is always good because you can you know what you're looking for and you can see if it's clean or not and um, yeah just just check at the volume controls the first test you would do with no sound and that way you know if there's signal there then it's in in your output stages or one of them if one channel's down um, you can check both sides of the pot obviously it's a dual pot one for the left channel one for the right and yeah basically you know that you're basically if, if the signal's there and it's good then it's and one channel's missing or distorted it's got to be in the amp section and again you can start going through but because most of them are DC coupled uh, and got feedback uh, any distortion in that section will sort of be everywhere in, in the output stage which just makes it a bit harder but again like I say you've got two channels and you can start comparing usually just the DC voltages on the transistors and just measure the same transistor if you look at the transistors usually they're a dual pair a PMP and an NPN these are all European like BC series probably BD 139s and 140s I guess the circuit will probably tell us that uh, which it doesn't but <laughs> always the way maybe the diagram for the board where are the transistors on here no, again it doesn't tell us just transistor number and the pinouts but um, yeah if you've got that just makes it easier often the Japanese ones are good you have a green transistor for a 2SA or B and a black for a, a NPN 2SC or 2SD and you just find the green one on one channel green one on the other one and measure the voltages on on each one the faulty channel and the good channel remembering which channel is the good and which is the bad and yeah just compare them and follow the chain through and see if you can isolate it um, sometimes you might have to pull a transistor or something out and isolate part way part of the chain from the rest of the chain and you should be able to trace the signal through um, all going well and you certainly get at least the DC voltages and compare them and if one's different to the other then you know something's out there sometimes you, you, you can't really check the transistor sometimes it'll be shorted or leaky or something uh, other times you just need to replace them and that's another thing you can do if you've got two channels if we suspect a transistor or a pair of them is faulty we just pull them out of one channel put them in the other and probably best to put the other ones back just so you're not going to worry anything uh, the faulty ones back in the other channel and see if the fault changes channels uh, is always a good way to test things um, if you haven't got substitute transistors lying around you can just just swap them between the channels sometimes you know a pair at a time or whatever just to make it quicker and um, see if the fault once the fault changes channel you know it was one of those devices that was faulty uh, so that's another good way to do it but I think that's probably enough of talking about just general stuff to do with an amp um, gives you the basic idea um, all you really need is a signal generator and oscilloscope if you do need to trace the signal through um, yeah, check, obviously check voltages are there first, no blown fuses, no shorted outputs if there are blown fuses. Um, if there's blown fuses, something shorted normally. Uh, if all that's fine and you've got power, um, one of the quickest checks is just yeah, put a signal in, go to your volume control, see if there's signal coming out of that. Um, if it's got a preamp out, that's even quicker, you don't even need to take the cover off to check that. 
to see if there's a signal coming out of the preamp. Um, again, if it's got a preamp out, you can also plug another preamp or signal into the amp, but just be warned that there's no volume control on the amp section itself. So don't just, <laughs> or at least don't have speakers hooked up if you're going to do it with, like, if you just plug a CD player or something in, you'll get full volume out of the amp pretty much. Um, so definitely have the speakers disconnected. I don't think you'll blow anything in it, but it's probably better if you can get something with a variable output. Um, basically a volume control, even if you have like a portable music device and plug into the headphone sockets on that. Um, with a 3.5 to um, twin RCA adapter, something like that, because at least that's got a volume control in it. But if you just plug a line level output device, like a CD player, tape deck, whatever, um, it's going to put the whole signal straight into the amp and the amp will basically treat it like um, full volume normally. Um, technically, probably if you had the volume, if you left the links in between pre-out and amp and had the volume control, that would keep the volume control in circuit. You could probably actually hook up an external device, turn the volume control down, and that would pull it down to ground and work as a volume control still. But um, that is a potential way to do it. But just so you don't go, don't have your speakers hooked up and just plug into the amp inputs um, direct inputs because it'll come out really really loud and you could damage your speakers certainly could damage your hearing or hurt yourself when you jump through the roof basically um, so yeah I think that's about all we really need to cover in this I'll get some old amps I've got it lying around here and actually start having a look at the faults in them and hopefully we'll learn something from that I doubt I'll find any with distortion in them I've only seen that in a few really old amps um, certainly older audio gear with things like old germanium transistors and stuff are common for it. There were some old amps, mainly in sort of various like um, uh, radiograms and those sort of things. They have the old AD161, 162 I think they were outputs and all the drive transistors were germanium. They got all sorts of weird faults in those things but luckily most of them were before my time so I didn't have to deal with that. Um, but most of this modern stuff you'll mainly just find blown outputs or no sound situation, one channel missing situation, and that's about it.